a popular sort of contemplative research approach in neuroscience, sort of where the Eastern traditions are, are meeting neuroscience, I guess you could say, is that the self is a construct potentially of the brain. I spoke to Shamil Shandaria about the Bayesian brain hypotheses, and as you're probably familiar with the free energy principle and how the brain appears to construct reality. And we are now applying those models to AI and mm -hmm. machine learning mm -hmm. algorithms. So for anyone that doesn't know, basically there's computational stacking within the brain that your brain is trying to predict reality just because it's computationally very explosive. There's a lot of data coming in from the senses and now potentially data coming in from the cells and your brain needs to take the past information and predict the future because mm -hmm. there's just not enough bandwidth in mm -hmm. the brain. So is it possible that what we call the self is also a construct of or an accumulation of memory, even even cell memory. I think it's. I think it's, it's very reasonable to say that. Uh, I think that what you described as prediction, this 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 top down flow of information, that our brain uh, conceptualizing this 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 information that's coming from the senses. Where does this top-down flow of information come from? Where do those predictions come from? They come from memory. Um, so I, I use this uh, in my book and in class. I use um, visual illusions. Um, well, for example, there's there's one with a uh, where you can see uh, either a young woman turned away or an old woman that's kind of in, in profile. It's a clever picture, but you can only see one at a time. You can't see them both at the same time. Even though you understand exactly how it works, you see where all the lines go, no matter how hard you try, you can't, you can't see both pictures at the same time. Another one is like two faces in a vase in the middle. Very simple, nothing's mysterious about this, but your perception can only focus on one or the other at that time. So that's that, that, that top, that, that, that's the prediction. That's the, we like to believe that we just passively take in senses, analyze them and come to a conclusion, but we're actually actively participating in our perception. We are, we're actively picking out things that we want to be perceiving. To perceive something, you have to decide that I'm either gonna be looking at the faces or I'm gonna be looking at the vase. You, you have to make that decision and then that's when you perceive it. But that decision, originates from memory. You had to see faces at some point in your life. You had to see vases at some point to, to memorize what they look like, to carry that image in your mind and to pick it out from this chaos of, of sensory experience. So in that sense, yes, absolutely. Our self is a layering of such memories. It is a layering of predictions that predicts predictions that it's, it's, a, it's overarching predictions that predict smaller predictions that predict even more specific predictions that predict even more specific predictions that predict what we will receive through our senses in real life it's a it's a nested hierarchy of levels of prediction all of which are embedded in the memory of of those cells that that carry those signals around so when we talk about cellular memories that includes the memory of neurons yes all those neurons, neurons are cells. Neurons are, are, are not different from any of those other cells. So definitely their cellular memories contribute to those nested levels of prediction that form who we are. Are other cells of the body also involved in those nested levels of prediction? Maybe, maybe. We don't know about that yet. That's not part of the free energy principle uh, by Friston and Clark. But I can easily see that they are involved in those levels and they participate in either supplying the information into the brain, as we discussed, as possible for trauma, or even maybe are participating in predicting that information and in, in giving, uh, the, in producing that top-down flow of information uh, that predicts ongoing, ongoing behavior. Uh, one good candidate could be glial cells uh, in, in, in that, that are inside the brain but are not neurons. Uh, they are well positioned to be non-neural cells that could retain some imprint of experience and could control the behavior of neurons uh, responding to ongoing information. And so, yeah, easily the state of a glial cell could 
contribute to our sense of self. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised by that. There would be big updates with <laughs> the model of our understanding of the, mm. the world if if that was the case. And yeah, as we said earlier, I think the more we <laughs> the more we discover, the more we realize we mm. don't know. Mm. Yeah, of course, the more we realize, we still have to learn. I mean, we're now at the point when we are beginning to. Well, I would say what AI now does is. Uh, maybe not emulates, but it is at least inspired by the electrical behavior of neurons. But this electrical behavior, those electrical signals that are passing between neurons, that is only one aspect of what they do. That is only one aspect of their physiology. Uh, there are thousands of other aspects of, 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 thousands of other processes that are happening in neurons that are not electri electrical pulses. Uh, and so I think that as we progress in in, in, in in technology and artificial intelligence, we will start incorporating more and more of those other neuronal biological processes and cellular processes into our models of intelligence. Right now, it's all electrical pulses interacting with each other. But if we incorporate more cell-like behaviors, then our AI might become more biorealistic. It might have a more realistic memory for example, it might it might respond to patterns of input more like a human would. It would learn from them uh, in in similar ways. It would modify itself. It would be more flexible. If I want to predict the the direction in which AI will go, I think it will gradually become more and more similar to to the body and to cells specifically. Yeah, and then you've also got like Penrose and Hammerhoff over there trying. Oh to... yeah, with the microtubules. <laughs> yeah, point yeah. it potential fundamental consciousness it's just yeah, yeah. it's oh, science has just become so interesting recently um i've also been following yeah michael levin professor michael levin's work pretty yeah pretty extensively and it seems like there would be a convergence and that it's ab about to or is already connecting pretty well with your work mm -hmm. um, he's looking at uh, bioelectricity with pattern memories for development and, and regeneration. So I is that something that you have been uh, looking into as well? And what your your I'm very inspired by Mike Levin's work. He's, he's definitely a major role model for me. I look up to him, and um, you know he's given me good advice, and we've, we've shared uh, our, 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 uh, our studies. We've sent them our cell lines. Hopefully, they will do something interesting with uh, with them as well. Um, yeah, I think our biggest point of overlap with, with Mike Levin is that we both think of these cellular processes like memory, like uh, like cognition, um, not metaphorically, but literally. And, and that's a big part of our message to the world, that when we're saying cellular memory or cellular cognition, as we already discussed, we're not using these words in quotation marks, we mean them literally. We mean that the more advanced forms of cognition and memory are built upon these molecular tools that have been around since before there were brains and animals and, and, and humans and anything like that. So, so all of these processes have deeper evolutionary roots than we like to than we like to believe on that point we we truly uh, agree and um, and i think that our work uh, is supportive of of, of each other's uh, in, in that in that respect uh, as far as bioelectricity and well i mean anything that passes through a neuron is well, well, spikes is bioelectricity so in a sense i am studying bioelectricity we haven't touched regeneration uh, yet so i would say that uh, Mike Levin's work is is more uh, is more on the on the body side. We, because we're coming from the brains, we're more still on the neuroscience side, but we're working on very very similar problems and definitely like-minded researchers. Thank you so much for listening to this amazing episode. Just a quick reminder that we recently released 30 Days of Meditation, Science and Bliss, which is free on the app due to the kindness of our founder. Whether you can help us financially or not. You could donate on the website or you could simply drop us a comment or a like or subscribe to the channel. We thank you so much and we can't wait to continue bringing the latest in neuroscience and contemplative practices.